why do we crave to get high? What are some tips for getting sober? And do the cravings ever go away? We'll be discussing all that and more in today's episode of Raised and Redeemed. What's up, you guys, and welcome back for season four of the Raised and Redeemed podcast. I am so excited to be back here with you on the podcast. I will be super honest with you. I am at the point of being super pregnant. I'm about six months. We got three more to go for baby Mila to get here, and I have been in total mom brain and moving into the new house brain, Um, so getting back to work has been a little bit of a challenge this time, Um, but as I'm going to talk about in today's episode, this work is so important to me um, and also helps in my just my path of sobriety and living out God's purpose for my life, so thank you guys, everyone who sticks along and who has emailed me and sent encouragement and asked when we're coming back. Um, I'm so excited to be here, but because I am preparing to have my first baby (laughs) and I don't know what that's going to look like in my life yet, I am scaling back the podcast at least for right now, we're going to be doing bi-monthly episodes every other Wednesday um, coming out with new content for you guys, but it's still going to be just as exciting as before. Just so you know what to look forward to a little bit this season, we have more testimonies with ex-sex workers. We have more testimonies from ex-new agers focusing on Um, with one of them, the sex magic world and just the darkness of that because you guys have asked me questions about that. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that this season. We have an ex-secular music artist, ex-adulterers, ex-Jews to Jesus, and so much more. I'm also hoping to get on an Orthodox priest to answer your questions about Christian Orthodoxy and perhaps have a couple of testimonies around um, people who have come to Orthodoxy as well and a little bit deeper dive into church history and to continue just going into it with you guys about what my appeal is to orthodoxy besides my husband, of course. (laughs) Okay, so getting into the meat of what we're talking about, why we crave to get high. So I'm just going to share a little bit with you guys about the inspo for this video before we get started. Um, When this video goes live, it is going to be near the end of January. So a lot of you just made it through the holiday season where there's a lot of temptations, maybe from your family, your friends, just the holiday, you know, you know the temptations of the holidays. So if you made it through, I'm so proud of you and congrats. And if you didn't, it's okay. Just keep taking the next step forward and take it one day at a time. And hopefully today's video will help you do that. So I recently had a dear friend and sister in Christ share with me that she has been struggling to get sober. Weed is a very big crutch in her life, and it's something that her and I have talked a lot about. And this just made me realize that it wouldn't be completely honest of me to not talk about this more with you guys because this was such a big part of my life. I started using substances when I was nearly 12 years old. Um, it started with pain pills and then spice and then weed and then alcohol and then everything else, um, all the you know party drugs and everything. And I substance abused for around 10 years of my life with alcohol and marijuana being the big ones Um, and marijuana being one that was really hard for me to let go of as a very anxiety prone person and as someone who had a lot of trauma and didn't know how to calm down and all of these things and then alcohol for you know, a whole plethora of other reasons. So just before I get started with this video, I wanted you to know that just if you're watching this because this is something you're going through, I relate to you and I'm coming to you from personal experience, not as an expert, not as a therapist or anything else like that, but as somebody who has walked this and is continuing to walk this. So I haven't smoked since 2021, and I haven't had an alcoholic drink since 2022. So three years sober from weed and two years sober from alcohol. Uh, And I'm going to go into why I made this life change, but first and foremost, it was just a conviction from God, a, a conviction that He gave me because I did abuse these things so much in the past and because I did use them as a crutch and it was a form of idolatry for me of going to these things instead of God. He placed it on my heart to 
get rid of these things and not lean on and rely on these things. So maybe it's the same for you, maybe not, but that's the place that I'm coming to from today. So in summary, today I'm going to share with you five reasons that we crave to get high, 10 things that helped me get sober, and just a little bit of real talk about whether or not the cravings ever go away. Before we get started, I wanted to share just a tidbit from this book that my husband has been reading called Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. He was reading this book to me the other night, you guys, and I had to take a few moments to just stare at a wall and reflect on my life. Um, And so I think this is a great intro for what we're about to talk about. So Stephen Pressfield says, before we begin ruthlessly deconstructing the amateur life, let's pause for a moment to give it its due. And he, just as a side note, he relates the amateur life to um, the addict's life a lot. So if that helps you understand sort of what we're talking about here. The amateur life is our youth. It's our hero's journey. No one is born a pro. You've got to fall before you hit bottom, and sometimes that fall can be a hell of a ride. So here's to blackouts and divorces, to lost jobs and lost cash and lost self-respect. Here's to time on the streets. Here's to years we can't remember. Here's to bad friends and cheating spouses, and to us too for being guilty of both. Becoming a pro in the end is nothing grander than growing up. So if this is a walk you're on, maybe you're just going through something that almost all of us go through and it's a journey of growing up. Unless, you know, I say a lot of us go through this, some people never grow up, but maybe you want more for your life and that's how you found this episode here today. Hey, everybody. First off, thank you so much for watching. Secondly, if you're enjoying this conversation, please support the show by liking, subscribing, leaving a review, or sharing it with a friend. And now back to the episode. So five reasons we crave to get high. I'm going to lead up to the most important ones at the end, so stick with me. Number one, I would say, is influences, be it cultural, social, and then these influences lead to a sense of curiosity, um, maybe about these substances or about how we would be on these substances, and that curiosity eventually leads to the action. And I'm just going to say, I think Eve was curious too. The second reason many people crave to get high is a mental break. Life can be really hard sometimes, and sometimes all we want is just a temporary relief, a temporary distraction. But that's the problem, is this solution is only temporary, and that problem is still going to be there the moment your sobriety returns. Number three, changing our state. A lot of times we think that a substance makes us a better, more peaceful, more confident person, but what if we could access that same side of ourselves but without a substance. Number four is depth and intimacy. We were all designed with this God-sized void in our heart, but many of us don't know how to truly seek Him. So instead of praying to the Lord and waiting on His relief and His answers, we seek out immediate resolutions and immediate relief. But this is a counterfeit way of filling that void that we were designed with intentionally. The fifth reason I would say we crave to get high, and this is a big one, is because we aren't living out our true God-given purpose. I'm going to read another page from Stephen Pressfield's Turning Pro, where he talks about the shadow life. In the shadow life, we live in denial and we act by addiction. We pursue callings that take us nowhere and permit ourselves to be controlled by compulsions that we cannot understand or are not aware of and whose outcomes serve only to keep us caged, unconscious, and going nowhere. The shadow life is the life of the amateur. In the shadow life, we pursue false objects and act upon inverted ambitions. The shadow life, the life of the amateur and the addict, is not benign. The longer we cleave to this life, the farther we drift from our true purpose, and the harder it becomes for us to rally the courage to get back. When we're living as amateurs, we're running away from our calling, meaning our work, our destiny, the obligation to become our truest and highest selves. Addiction becomes a surrogate for our calling. We enact the addiction instead of embracing the calling. Why? Because to follow a calling requires work. It's hard. It hurts. It demands entering the pain zone of effort, risk, and exposure. 
So what are the big dreams or big goals that you might be avoiding? What's up, you guys? I'm so excited to announce a new Raised and Redeemed merch drop. We took our apparel to the next level this time with our new Running to the Cross design that you can order in a crew neck, hoodie, oversized tee, or even on your new favorite coffee mug. Check out this design and more on RaisedAndRedeemed.com to order yours and support the show today. Maybe you saw yourself in one of those five reasons I just shared. Maybe your reason seems like something a little different, and that's okay. But the next part of this episode, I'm going to share 10 things that helped me get sober. Number one is conviction. I truly think in order to make a huge life change, such as getting sober, it usually requires some kind of conviction from God. For other people, this might look like hitting a rock bottom and finally admitting to yourself that you need change. They say we won't change until staying the same gets so much more uncomfortable than actually making the change. So the verse Romans 14, 23 was really important in my growing conviction when I first became a new believer. This says, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So I remember being a new Christian and now believing in the Bible and continuing to do things that were in accordance more so with my old life and my flesh than this new life and living in the spirit. I was still learning. Um, Maybe you're in a similar place. Um, And I just remember feeling a lot of conviction about the things that I knew I shouldn't be doing. And I had a lot of questions too, like, oh, but what if I could do this? Um, Maybe God does think this is okay. But I just had this constant warring inside of myself. And I finally realized when I read this verse that if you're not doing something in faith, then it is a sin for you to be doing that thing, whatever it is. Um, And so for some people, it looks like different things in different seasons. Some seasons, I even feel convicted to take a break from coffee or anything else that might be becoming an idol or a crutch for me. And a lot of times our convictions are different in different seasons, but right now, maybe you are being convicted by God to give this thing up. The second thing that helped me in getting sober was recognizing the reality of the spiritual world around me. If you've seen or heard my testimony, you know that it was seeing a demon that finally brought me to crying out to Jesus and realizing that the Bible was true and all of these things. So after, you know, being a new believer, I didn't want to let in demons. I didn't want to open portals to demons. And I realized that drugs and alcohol, you know, abusing substances is one of the ways in which we open portals to demons. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I knew that whenever I was under the influence, I was a vulnerable little lamb just waiting to be devoured by the enemy, and I didn't want to keep putting myself in those kind of compromising situations. Number three was getting focused on what God's plan was for my life and trusting that His ways were better. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future. Obedience is a really hard thing, especially when it requires us to give up something that has been a crutch for us for a very long time. But when you trust that the Lord's ways are better, that His plans for your life are better, then this allows you to take these faithful steps into obedience a little more easily. Number four is environment. In the beginning of my sobriety journey, the more I hung out with people that I drink and smoked with, the more I relapsed back into those old ways of life. So something that helped me very early on was being in the church like three to four days a week. This is before I met my husband, but I was involved in ACA support groups. That stands for Adult Children of Alcoholics um, because I mostly feel like I didn't struggle with the addiction as much myself as I was coping from the pains of having addict parents um, by continuing to numb and cope in these similar ways. Um, And the second one was Celebrate Recovery. So the 12-step programs are really great, but Celebrate Recovery is hosted usually within a church, and they focus more on Jesus being the one who can redeem you and help you overcome uh, the temptations of your addiction, whereas AA and um, ACA, these more general 
uh, 12-step support programs focus on a higher power and not specifically Jesus. So I went to both of those. Um, the environment of just being around my my church people in church groups, um, beginning to build a new network of people that weren't just the kind of people that I partied with or drank and smoked with. The last part of environment that I'm going to focus on is I actually married a man who never struggled with drugs and alcohol and uh, held me to the same standard of maintaining my sobriety. So because he's the person that I'm hanging out with, you know, all the time more than anybody else, this really helped me in getting sober because my primary environment didn't encourage um, or even condone, you know, slipping up and going back into my old ways. Number five is developing healthier coping mechanisms. If you have a long history of getting drunk and high, this is probably one of your primary coping mechanisms to whatever life brings your way. But there are other things that you can do to find relief, such as crying, exercising, confiding in somebody that is close to you, or even just taking that moment to pray to the Lord and bear your heart to the Lord. Number six is finding purpose in my pain. This is why a lot of AA um, and recovery groups will have you mentor someone else after you've been sober for so long is giving back really helps you stay accountable. It's why I mentioned in the beginning of this video that you guys, my listeners, the Raised and Redeemed family are so important to me is because Raised and Redeemed is a part of my sobriety. Uh, this ministry helps me stay accountable to continue to become the woman of God that I want to be and that maybe the world expects me to be or I feel like the world expects me to be. Once you start giving back to others, you feel the weight of the responsibility of knowing that you don't want others to stumble and you don't want to be a stumbling block for those other people by you stumbling. So it's a next level of accountability and you maintaining your sobriety. On that similar note, number seven is remembering my testimony, remembering my Exodus story and everything that God pulled me out of and knowing that I don't ever want to go back to that place, A, and B, there's just way too much to lose now. Sharing your testimony with others helps you stay in constant remembrance of that and hearing other people's testimonies does a similar thing as well. Number eight is finding healthier adrenaline rushes. A lot of people who get high do it for that exact reason because they want to feel a high. Uh, so for me, this now looks like traveling and new experiences. A part of growing up is, you know, you have more responsibilities and you're not going to be able to travel all the time like maybe you could when you were young. I know I experienced that. I feel like I was doing everything and going everywhere when I was young, but you grow up, you get responsibilities, you get a family, you can't do that as much. But what you can do is plan for these trips uh, and have something to look forward to throughout the year. This might seem like a simple thing and you know it drives my husband crazy sometimes, but I need like a constant, at least perception that some kind of adventure is coming, that I'm going to have new experiences and novelty in my life. And this is a way healthier thing than getting high. Number nine, we're all about goals in this house. So staying focused on my goals for this life and the life to come. This has really helped me in staying sober. Um, maybe for you, you have health goals. If you start this new gym routine and you're working out and eating healthy, how is smoking going to help you maintain those new fitness or health goals? Or maybe you have goals about eternity and how it's going to be when you meet Jesus. And so going back to the spiritual awareness being something that helped me get sober, maybe it's this that helps you you know, refrain from giving into that temptation is knowing one day you're going to look Jesus in the eyes and wanting him to be proud of you. So whatever doesn't contribute to your big end goals, subtract those things from your life because life is too short. And number 10, and this one might be the hardest one, but that is waiting on the Lord. So it's not enough to just pray to the Lord and, you know, expect him to give you immediate relief or an immediate response or resolution to your problem, but really learning how to wait well um, while continuing to trust him. Because if you've been walking with the Lord for some time, you know that he doesn't work um, in immediacies the way that you know substances provide an immediate relief, a temporary, a counterfeit, a self-destructive relief. Um, but it, there's an immediate response with God. It's oftentimes not like that. So we have to learn how to just be in our Job seasons without numbing and coping through that season and to really show that we trust him and we believe that he is going to deliver us and help us and answer our prayers.
Okay, real talk. Do the cravings ever go away? I would love to stand here today and tell you that, oh my gosh, God has just completely delivered me. I became a Christian and I never had a craving again. But that has not been my story. And maybe that's not yours. And maybe this sets someone free today to know that, you know, you can love Jesus and still have these cravings. That is why God tells us to capture all of our thoughts with Christ, because I think it's normal to get caught up in the old ways of the flesh, at least in the mind, but we have to capture those thoughts before we take action on them. I also think this is just a normal part of working out our salvation and carrying our cross. We have to wake up every day and carry that cross, and sometimes it's heavy. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need to confess and reach out for other believers to lend a hand or a kind word or a piece of encouragement. I think that's normal and we shouldn't self-isolate, um, especially when we feel a craving arise. But here are some questions I ask myself when they do arise. What hard thing might I be avoiding? Have I brought it to the Lord? And am I waiting on Him? How is my intimacy with my husband right now? Do we need to reconnect? Am I confessing and confiding in other believers? Do I just need a vacation? (laughs) And am I doing all I can do to live out my true God-given purpose? Something that was very overwhelming for me at the beginning of committing to sobriety was thinking, how am I going to do this for the rest of my life? Um, That thought can send you into a spiral itself. But realizing that we just need to keep taking it one day at a time and making the right choices each day was something that helped set me free because we weren't meant to handle the weight of every day of the rest of our lives, but we can handle the weight of today, at least with the help of the Lord. So take it one day at a time, be gracious with yourself, and just begin to ask yourself some of the questions that I've shared with you today. I hope this video was able to help you. I'm so excited to be back for season four once again. Um, And stay tuned for the next episode going live in two weeks with Paige Lohman. It's a redemption story from an ex-sex worker, ex-escort, ex-addict that I think you'll find really encouraging. So until next time, I'll see you guys then.